All right. Well, this morning we're going to finish off Romans chapter 10. And I will give a brief recap of what we looked at last week as, as we would, uh, after I read the text, and then see how this connects to what Paul has already been talking about and how it's bridging to the next chapter where um, Paul is going to talk about God's plan for Israel, what he's doing with Israel right now, why he's doing what he's doing with Israel uh, right now, why he's turned to us, to the Gentiles, in order to save us and what he intends through this process, as far as gathering together that group that he talked about at the beginning of Romans chapter 9, the Israel that is not from Israel. Okay, and that's talking about his chosen, his, his sheep, his spiritual Israel that he is gathering from both the Jews and the Gentiles. All right, so let's read the text, first of all, Romans 10, 11 through 21. Paul writes, for the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all abounding in riches for all who call on him, for whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. However, they did not all heed the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. But I say, surely they have never heard, have they? Indeed they have. Their voice has gone out into all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. But I say, surely Israel did not know, did they? First, Moses says, I will make you jealous by that which is not a nation. By a nation without understanding will I anger you. And Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I became manifest to those who did not ask for me. But as for Israel, he says, all the day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. Well, um, hopefully in, in this message we'll untangle the things that, that Paul has said. Sometimes it's kind of hard to follow his, his argument, to follow his logic, but it does make, it does make good sense. It's, it is God's Word. Now last week, again remember, after expressing his desire and prayer, that the Lord would have mercy on the Jews and save them. Uh, Paul explained more clearly where it is that the Jews actually failed. He says they were zealous for God, like, like Paul was be, before his conversion. But it was a misdirected zeal. They did not really know how to please him, and that, even though God had given them the law. Remember, the Jews mis misunderstood the law. They thought God had given them the law so that by keeping it, they might make themselves good enough for God to accept them. And they thought they were good enough. And so they didn't receive the gift of righteousness that he freely gives through his son because they misunderstood his work and their need for that work because they thought they were good enough. Now, Paul says they should have known better. Moses had warned them that if they tried to earn their own justification, remember their acceptance with God, justification meaning God, God, God declares us to be righteous, acceptable to Him. Uh, Moses warned them that if they tried to do that through their own efforts, that they would have to stand or fall by those efforts. But Paul's already told us we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. None of us can be acceptable to God through our own works, which is why Paul also pointed out that Moses pointed to the way of faith. He wasn't pointing to the law as a way of salvation. He was actually warning them against that, pointing to the way of faith, the only way that they could be justified, that God would do what for them was impossible. And that's where that language came in 
where he says, who can ascend into heaven, you know? Um, they couldn't ascend into heaven. They couldn't do the impossible to bring the Messiah down. God had already sent him into the world. He had sent him freely. In the Old Testament, he would send him, but to Paul's audience, he already has. They couldn't cross the deep, uh, cross the, the sea to discover God's will. And as Paul says, descend into the deep in order to bring the Messiah up from the dead. Again, that would be impossible, but God raised him from the dead. All they really needed to do was to believe. That was true of the Jews under Moses, and that was true uh, with regard to the Jews that Paul was ministering to. They simply needed to trust and receive his Messiah from their hearts and confess him as their Lord, and God would save them. You know, one interesting point here to recognize is that Moses was preaching the same gospel as Paul, which is why Paul is pointing to Moses and what he said in those days. Because remember, we saw, if you remember last week, the passage that Paul quoted in that earlier part of Romans chapter 10 was Deuteronomy 30, where Moses is clearly speaking about the blessings of the new covenant and tells them that uh, what you need is near you in your heart and in your mouth, that if you confess uh, Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. It's the same gospel in the old covenant and in the new, just a different way of communicating it. Well, this morning, Paul now returns to the theme that he began in the previous chapter, that uh, the theme that all Israel... And again, the true Israel, the spiritual Israel, the elect Israel of God was not made up of Jews only, but also of Gentiles. We kind of take that for granted, but remember in Paul's day, the Jews had a real difficult time with that, that their Messiah would be given to the nations, these unclean people that they wanted nothing to do with, the Pharisees would pull in their robes when they passed by, that, that they were ostracized, well, yes. The Lord was turning to the Gentiles. Uh, God said in the Old Testament, remember, that he would save not all of Jacob's descendants, but he would save a remnant of them. There was always that remnant, but also that he would send his gospel to the nations. Now, this morning, I want us to see four things from this text. I want to see, first of all, Paul reaffirms that God's salvation is available to all. And again, that's something we take for granted, but... It was something that um, the Jews would not take for granted. But secondly, to receive that salvation, one needed to hear the gospel before they could believe and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. That goes without saying. Now, Paul goes on to say, all Israel heard it, but most rejected it. And then lastly, that's why God was now turning to the Gentiles. Now, again, that's the bridge that we're going to see for chapter 11. So let's look at these four points uh, one at a time. First of all, Paul reminds us that salvation is available to everyone. He writes in verse 11, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. Now remember, Paul had quoted this passage from Isaiah before, earlier at the end of chapter 9, where we noted and where actually Paul noted that Jesus never disappoints. To trust in Jesus is to gain everything that is worth having, and it is to lose nothing that is worth keeping, okay? Jesus doesn't disappoint, but here Paul is focusing on who it is that may believe. Whoever wants him may have him. And again, that's the difficult part for the Jew, this transition from the old covenant to the new covenant, the new covenant being much more embraceive. In the New Covenant, Paul is telling us that there is no distinction between Jew and Gentile, notwithstanding, you know, that very popular theology in, in the church today, dispensationalism, that says God has two different plans for two different people, basically two different religions. You know, there was a religion of the Old Covenant that was for the Jews, and that plan's been put on hold, and now the church age, which is some mystery, is taking place. And that includes Gentiles, and then God's going to turn back to Israel. But you see, Paul is saying there is no distinction between them. God's plan is the same for both. In verse 12, for the same Lord is Lord of all, 
abounding in riches for all who call on him. Now, we're not second-class citizens, but we are full members of God's family, okay, of God's covenant family. Uh, we saw that in Ephesians chapters 2 and 3. God gives the riches of his grace to all who call upon him, his forgiveness freely, the righteousness of Christ that we need to be accepted by God. And having his righteousness, that inheritance that he gives us in his kingdom, not just the kingdom that we see right now, the visible church, but the new heavens and the new earth that we will get to enjoy forever. So just as Paul earlier said, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, which includes both Jews and Gentiles, so all are offered this grace. Paul says again in verse 13, whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Again, the same passage that Peter quoted on the day of Pentecost. Now again, think about this just for a moment. Under the Old Covenant, if anyone wanted to be saved, if they wanted to seek Israel's God, they had first to become proselytes to Judaism, right? Uh, we, we say evangelism was magnetic. People had to come to Israel because that's where the light was. And they had to be circumcised. And they had to keep the law of Moses. Though there were those Gentiles who weren't circumcised and they still joined themselves to Israel's God, but not fully. They were called God-fearers such as Cornelius and his household. But they had to join themselves to Israel's worship because it was only through that worship, the ceremonial system, that they could learn about Christ, and that, they, that they might learn that they need him and they might trust in him. But now that he has come, the gospel has been sent to the nations. Gentiles can now be saved without becoming Jews. Now, you can see why the problem arose that, that did arise in, in the, the New Testament times. Um, the Judaizers, they just could not work their way through this. They still had the Old Testament model. No, if a Gentile is going to be saved, he has to be, become a proselyte. He has to be circumcised and observe the law of Moses. That's something that Paul had to address again and again. Even Peter was surprised when he saw the Spirit being poured out on Cornelius and his household without their being circumcised. Hey, that was a, that was a problem. But the Lord is, was showing them that that is the way things are now. Uh, a, a Gentile doesn't have to become a Jew. The door is now open to God, to come to God through the Lord Jesus Christ to everyone, to whoever will call on the name of the Lord. All may enter through the Lord Jesus Christ and find salvation through Him. Okay, that's the first point. But the second point is, before the Gentiles or the Jews, for that matter, can call on Him, whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved, they first need to hear Him. So second, we see the importance of missions and evangelism. Paul asks the question, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How are they going to reach out in faith to him? How are they going to trust him? How are they going to receive the Lord Jesus Christ if they have never heard about Jesus Christ? His obedience, his death on the cross, his resurrection. Faith requires content. We need to know to whom we must look. So the second question how will they believe in him whom they have not heard? Now, I want you to notice something interesting that Paul is saying here because I told you I was going to address this this morning. Paul addresses this. Notice that Paul does not say, how will they believe in him about whom they have not heard? But rather he says, how will they believe in him whom they have not heard? Okay. Faith requires that we know who Jesus is. We have to know who, whom to trust. But notice Paul says that we also need to hear him. We need to hear Jesus as he speaks through his gospel. You know, Paul talked about the gospel in chapter 1. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Well, how is the gospel made, power, uh, made powerful to save someone? Uh, 
Well, we know that God makes it powerful through His Holy Spirit, but what exactly happens when that happens? Well, He opens our eyes, shows us the beauty of Christ, but here Paul is telling us something else happens. Christ speaks through His Word, and they hear the voice of Christ. They hear the voice that raises the dead, much as when Jesus stood before the, the tomb of Lazarus and he says, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus was dead. He was unable uh, to respond because he had been dead for several days. And as, as Martha said, Lord, by now he, he stinks. <laughs> you know, his, his flesh is corrupted. But Jesus speaks with a voice that raises the dead. Lazarus is given life and he hears and he responds. That is what Jesus does through the gospel to those who are spiritually dead. He raises them to life through his speech. Well, then Paul goes on to say, how are they going to hear Jesus? How are they going to hear him without a preacher, without someone who is commissioned by the Lord Jesus Christ to go and bring that message to the lost? I mean, this is how he spoke to us, wasn't it? Each one of us heard the gospel from some messenger of Jesus. We heard his voice. Well, how will they preach unless they are sent? If no one goes, no one is going to hear his voice. Now, we know that this applies to missionaries. We know this applies to evangelists. We know this applies to preachers, right? But isn't it true that Jesus has commissioned not just them, but his entire church? And hasn't he sent all of us? Isn't that what the Great Commission is all about? To reach those who are around us with the gospel. And isn't that what we see the early church actually doing? Now, there was a time when you know, there was a huge collection of Christians in Jerusalem when the gospel started there. But when it was the Lord's time to begin for them to spread out, he caused persecution that that moved them along and they were scattered everywhere. And what is it that the early church did everywhere they went? They went everywhere telling everyone they saw about Jesus Christ, right? Because the news was just too good to keep to themselves. So Jesus was speaking through them. And Jesus wants to speak through us. And let's not forget that this is an unspeakable privilege, as Paul writes in verse 15, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. As I mentioned before, when, when we do this, when, when we are the heralds of the gospel, the ambassadors of Christ, we are beautiful, okay? We're, we're beautiful to the Lord. He came into this world to save people, to save his people, and when we are a part of that process, he loves that. But we're also beautiful to those who hear and receive this message. Now, again, we, we too often think about, you know, <clears throat> how we're going to look to those people who reject the gospel. You know, they think, they're going to think maybe we're crazy, or they're going to hate us, or maybe say something nasty. But we should be thinking more about how we're going to appear to those who, who do believe, who do receive the gospel. Uh, they will love us for caring enough about them to share the gospel with them. And only the people who receive the Lord Jesus Christ will, or at least those who recognize that, you know, at least we believe it's important and important enough to risk this. But it is something that is beautiful to the Lord, and that's one of the things we really need to focus on. Well, they need to hear before they're ever going to be able to call on him. But whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, Paul next, next addresses whether Israel has responded to this message. You know, it's interesting. This is where he begins because he's already answered this question when he said, not all Israel is descended from Israel. They have not all responded. He said in verse 27 of chapter 9, Though the number of the sons of Israel be like the sand of the sea, even though God will fulfill his promise to Abraham to multiply his seed as the sand by the sea or as the stars in the heaven, he says it is the remnant that will be saved. Remember what he says? Oh, actually, I think we're going to see that yet. How he says to Elijah, um, you know, that he had reserved so many that had not bowed the knee to Baal. 
So the same is true in every time frame. Such was the case now. There is the remnant, okay? Not all. So he writes in chapter 10, verse 16, however, they did not all heed, they did not all listen to, they did not all receive the good news, the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? Now again, see how Paul is pointing to the Old Testament to show us that this was predicted by God. This, you know, this is what was going to happen. This time he was quoting Isaiah 53, verse 1, which if you remember Isaiah 52 at the end and Isaiah 53, it's all about the suffering Messiah. And this is sandwiched between two prophecies regarding Christ's suffering. And the prophet asks the question, who's going to believe my report? Who's going to believe what I have to say? That this Messiah that we're expecting to lead us to victory over God's enemies is going to suffer and die in order to bring us salvation? Well, the implied answer to his question is very few. Very few are going to believe this report, and Paul sees that as being fulfilled in his own day. Paul says, we know that faith comes from hearing. He's already argued that that's how God creates faith. They have to hear the gospel, and that hearing must come from the word. There has to be somebody to communicate it. So maybe the Jews haven't heard. Well, Paul's already told us that that isn't the case. They have heard the gospel, remember? Uh, he told them through Moses. But he goes on to say in verse 18, but I say, surely they have never heard, have they? Indeed, they have. Their voice has gone out into all the earth and their words to the, end, the ends of the world. Now, remember I told you I was going to address this particular point when I read the call to worship because here he's quoting Psalm 19 from our call to worship. And it may be confusing that he quotes the part of the psalm that has to do with natural revelation, the evidence that God gives of himself through the creation that leaves everyone without excuse. The entire world is without excuse for not believing that God exists. As a matter of fact, Paul says everybody knows that God exists. And how do they know that? Well, again, remember the apologetic series that we saw or that we you know, went through by R.C. Sproul? He was just pointing out many of the... One of the many different ways that the world knows that God exists and they have no excuse for their unbelief. Now, why does Paul quote this to prove that Israel has heard the gospel, especially when we know that natural revelation, okay, general revelation does not contain the gospel? Why would he quote the passage that has to do with it to say that Israel has heard. Well, he appears to be saying that even as the whole world sees God through natural revelation, so the Jews have seen the gospel through his word. Remember that that psalm that we read does not address just general revelation, but it also addresses special revelation, the word of God, the law of God, um, and that contains the gospel. The Jews, I think Paul is saying, even as the whole world has seen general revelation and knows that God exists, so Israel has special revelation, and they have heard the gospel. Now, one commentator points out that Paul quotes in, in this passage that we're reading, he quotes from each section of the Old Testament scriptures to make the same point. In verse 9, he's quoting from Moses, which is the law, the Pentateuch. He's the author. In verses 20 and 21, he's quoting from Isaiah, or that section, the prophets. And in verse 18, he's quoting from the Psalms, which is what we've just looked at. And that's included in the writings. And he's saying the Jews have heard the gospel from every different part of God's word. And so they are without excuse. Now, again, let me just put in a plug for what we're going to be looking at this evening. Dr. Reeves is going to be talking about John Owen, who strongly affirmed that the Old Testament contains the same gospel as the New. Otherwise, he tells us it would be an entirely different religion 
one that would have no relevance to us today and from which we could really learn nothing helpful. But that isn't the case. It contains the gospel. It is the gospel, which is why Jesus and his disciples continually quoted from the Old Testament to prove to the Jews that what they were saying was true. This is the fulfillment of what God said he would do. The, you know, remember that the, the, new, the new Testament is, is in the old concealed, and the new Testament is the old essentially revealed. Okay, so Paul's point is that the Jews all knew, but they still didn't believe. Okay, some of them did, but, but most of them didn't. So finally, Paul brings up one last subject, and it's the purpose that he has in quoting these particular verses. Now, what he's doing here is, is he's introducing the subject of the next chapter, why God sent his gospel to the Gentiles, why we have become the recipients of Israel's blessings. Notice verse 19. Moses says, I will make you jealous by that which is not a nation. By a nation without understanding will I anger you. Okay, so what Paul is saying is that God has turned to us in his mercy to the Gentiles to provoke his people, the Jews, to jealousy, to make them angry so that they might turn to him. Okay, we have the gospel because they have rejected the gospel. And that really is the main point of chapter 11. Now, he then quotes Isaiah to show how unexpected this was on the part of the Gentiles. I mean, the Gentiles didn't even know God was doing this until they found themselves to be the recipients of his blessings. Verse 20, I was found by those who did not seek me. I became manifest to those who did not ask for me. I mean, think about, again, the Gentile cultures, all the false religions. They were basically minding their own business. They weren't seeking God. They thought that they had a plausible explanation for everything that exists, you know, through their pantheon of gods or whatever it might be, when suddenly the Lord shakes up their world by sending the Apostle Paul to preach Christ, and God's op God opens their eyes, and He saves them, okay? Well, isn't this how it was with us? I mean, didn't we think we were just fine until the Lord came to us in His mercy? We may not have been seeking the Lord at all, but God breaks in with his grace. Well, God had patiently waited for his people to come to him, to Israel. Paul again quotes Isaiah in, in verse 21, all day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people, and they wouldn't respond, so now he gives them an added incentive. Now they would see those who were not a people, actually those that they despised, become the people of God, and that would provoke them than to turn to the Lord. Now, as Paul reflects on this in the next chapter, he's going to say this. In conclusion, I thought I would just kind of jump ahead a little bit to give us a preview. He says, For God has shut up all in disobedience, so that he may show mercy to all. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, and unfathomable his ways, that God would bring about the salvation of all peoples in the way that he has. Well, Paul is telling us that God is a God of mercy, right? As well as a God of justice. God is going to hold those who don't repent and turn to Christ accountable. But we do need to remember that in his mercy, he sent Jesus Christ for us, as well as for the Jews. That was his plan from the beginning, you know, that there would be this partial hardening that has taken place in Israel, that he might turn to the Gentiles in order that he might save from the Gentiles to provoke the Jews to jealousy. And in this process, as we're going to see next, in, in the next chapter, bring all of his people to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. What I don't want us to miss this morning is, is how we are a part of this plan and why we're a part of the plan, okay? It is because of what he's doing with Israel, but that we are a part of this plan, and that's what we need to meditate on
as we come to the table this morning. Because remember, the table, the sacrifice of the Messiah, it may appear as though it was meant just for the Jews. But Paul is telling us it was God's intention all along also to include us. Jesus suffered and died for us. If we are trusting in him this morning, that's what we need to meditate on as we come to the table in order to, again, look to Christ, to thank him, to worship God, and to receive uh, what he has for us this morning. So let's do that for a few moments. And again, as we're praying, as we're preparing to come to the table, let's not forget that we need to renew each time we come to the table, our faith in the Lord Jesus, He's the only way of salvation, the only one that makes us acceptable to God. It's not what we do, it's what He does. And again, that's going to be emphasized this evening uh, even more so. Um, but we also need to examine our hearts to make sure that we are turning from our sins, from those hateful things we do toward others and towards God, and renew our love for Him. Okay, so let's, let's do that in, in these few moments.